When I started my first negotiation there, which was 1990, we ranked about 10th in pay. By the end of my negotiating uh, for this band, um, we were ranked number one in pay. Today's guest is a really interesting person. He has been in the L.A. Phil since 1986, was principal bassist of the San Diego Symphony before that, and he's launched this YouTube channel with these fantastic videos where he's singing and playing the bass. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. We are talking today with Peter Rofe, and what a cool window into the music world Peter has had. We talk about his background, getting into music, what it was like playing in the San Diego Symphony and what that orchestra was like in those years, his move to the L.A. Phil, the evolution of the L.A. Phil and their contracts over the years. He has been a negotiator for the L.A. Phil for many years. How orchestras have fared during the pandemic, the L.A. Phil in particular, and getting inspired to launch this YouTube channel, which has been a very cool pandemic project. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Peter. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later, but let's dive into this chat with Peter Ruffay. So you're from the area. Where, where specifically are you from? I grew up in Los Angeles, born okay. and raised here. Wow. Um, Fairfax Pico. I don't know if you know that area. Uh, not not the, the, there's like a faint bell that's ringing. I don't yeah, think I know it. <laughs> Mid city. Yeah. You know, basically the heart of the Jewish area at the time. Uh huh. <laughs> wow. Wow. And then you were in San Diego. You were principal of San Diego prior to L.A. Phil. I started in that was my first gig, real gig, you know, orchestra job. Um, started there in 73 as a 2D player, section player. And about I can't remember. It must have been two years later, I think, that I became principal. What was that job like at that point? Was that was that uh, full time? Was it like the bulk of what you do, but you were doing other things? How how did an orchestra like that work in the seventies? Um, it was not quite a full time job. It was one of those orchestras that rehearsed at night, and um, you were offered. I can't remember it really. It was so long ago. It was, it was <laughs> nineteen seventy three. Um, I was twenty one, so I was just thrilled to have that work um but it soon grew and became a like a 36 week orchestra and then a 40 week or you know it, it just grew over time and it was um interesting and fun to be part of a an orchestra that was expanding and growing and getting better and better with each season um and it's now it's actually a very good orchestra even though the pay is not in the A Orchestra League, it's a really fine playing orchestra. I, I follow it. I still keep track. I still have friends there. And because um, I spent 13, 14 years in that orchestra and loved living in San Diego. Um, yeah. I, I, I get that. There are people that they decide their profession is going to be living in San Diego, I think. <laughs> I know a lot of people from the Midwest. They're like, oh, the, I, uh, here is my forever home and I'll do whatever to make it work. Right, right. So, um, yeah, and, and you know, I, the thing for me, it was, it was a great place for me to make my mistakes. And I did. <laughs> <Made plenty. laughs> so it, it was, uh, for me, it was a great opportunity and it as i was saying it's, it's just gotten better and better over the years and really has become um a stepping stone orchestra mm -hmm. so a lot a lot of players it's their first gig and then they move on to bigger jobs yeah and that's where you were playing with brian marcus right he was in the in the orchestra right. for a period of time he was there um, i can't remember exactly the years he was there so you know so i i went to how far back do you want me to go? In, we can in go my... anywhere. There's no structure or anything to these. We can go as far back as you want. There's, it's, it's all oh, good. You're going to edit this out so you don't have to use oh, yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my history in music is very different than the majority of my colleagues. Um, I started playing piano when I was five and played piano until the age of 13. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then 
for my bar mitzvah, my parents got me a guitar. And then I started playing guitar in with friends in little rock bands. But they needed a bass player because they already had two guitars. So I switched to bass. This was probably age 14. And um, then played in rock bands all the way through, like, you know, garage bands. And But we would gig around and we'd do parties and we'd do, you know, fraternities and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, we were little kids. We, this was like junior high and high school. All through that and um, did that. In fact, one of the, some of the people I grew up playing with ended up, being the um in the group heart do you know that group oh get out of here really that's so cool well, i grew up with howard lease he's the lead guitar player in heart and he was my first band that's who i was playing with with howard and then later on um the producer of heart a guy named mike flicker who did who helped produce that group he was also another guy i grew up with so i was always around pretty good musicians and people with really good years but um then college i went to ucla because i needed to avoid the draft howard and friends weren't in college howard lease they moved up to vancouver in canada to avoid the draft um and it was after the war that they then moved to seattle and met up with the wilson girls this the singers um Anyway, at, at UCLA, I wanted to um, started getting back into studying music more seriously, and at that point, switched to string bass. Um, so it was my first year at UCLA. I, I went to Peter Mercurio's bass class. He was my teacher with my electric bass. I said, "Look, I know I'm a, I can read music. I know I'm a scales. I know I'm a here. Look at that. I can do all that. Can you teach me to do this?" <laughs> and said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and about six months later, I was principal of the UCLA Symphony, playing with American principal in American Youth Symphony. So I progressed really rapidly, and that was just the route I took. By the end of my college career. So I'm a senior now. Um, Peter Mercurio says, look, um, there's an audition down in San Diego. You should go and take it because I think you can get it. So I did. And that's what happened. Wow. So you've been doing this orchestra thing for quite some time, my friend. <laughs> wow. You got well, an early start. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, not as long as like some of my colleagues who started doing this when they were, you know, preteen, mm -hmm. when they were eight or nine or 10 or something like Chris Hanulik, who was what, probably six when he started playing the bass or something, yeah. Yeah. you know, so it's not that I got into it late. So I was when I, it's not that I wasn't a musician and like I said I could play this electric bass but um didn't really switch to string bass till I was 17 and got, got, the gig, got the gig in San Diego when I was like 20. <laughs> now it's interesting yeah you have both a late start but then kind of like an maybe not an early career for that time but you know you've been you've been you've been doing the orchestra gig for a while yeah well can so I started in San Diego in 73 what 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 is that 50 some odd more than 50 years or i don't know what is that it's a chunk of time uh for sure so somewhere roughly around there <laughs> right in 86 so sandy i loved san diego had a great time there then in the mid 80s it started having financial problems mm -hmm. and i couldn't didn't want to deal with that so i started i took an audition in la and i moved to la in 86 got the position here and i've been in la since 86. okay so that's also a chunk of time from la from 86 to the present and i know lots of changes in that orchestra between 86 and now yeah, i kind of specialize in orchestras that are like making ups and downs going forward because <laughs> that's what happened in san diego so when i was in san diego the height of san diego there were it was an awesome band the concert master was andres cardenas who is the was who went on to become concert master in pittsburgh Judy LeClaire, bassoon, first bassoon in New York now. Um, Dennis Michael, another bassoonist, bassoon in Chicago. Arlen Fast, bassoon in New York. I mean, Cindy Phelps was there. She's now principal in New York Phil. I mean, it was that orchestra fed a lot of major orchestras. Yeah. And so it, it really made huge progress over those 13 years that I was there. Yeah.
for sure. And then the same thing now then happened in L.A. Now, L.A. was always a good orchestra. But what happened over my 35 year career there, it's been, I guess, about 35 years, something like that. Um, 35 years. It's just every year with every audition, with every contract, with everything, it just leaps and bounds. Mm. 86, I was hired by Andre Previn. I actually haven't had that many music directors there. I had Andre Previn, then I had Essa Pekka for what, 18 years or so, mm-hmm. 17 years, 18 years. And now, now Dudamel, Dudamel's, it's probably been 10 years with Dudamel. I, I don't know. I'm not that good with years in math, but it's been a long time. Yeah. It's incredible that he's been there that long. I still think of those first, you know, when, when you'd see publicity about L.A. Phil and Dudamel being there. And it's like, yeah, I guess time flies. Seems, seems, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it isn't 10 years, but I think it. I can't remember. Whatever. It's been a long time with with all of them. And now I'm I think I mentioned the other day on the phone, I'm I'm turning 70 this year and I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to move on. <laughs> maybe it's time to retire. I probably got another two, three years worth of orchestra playing in me. And then I think it's uh, it might be time to let some younger kid take my spot. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the things that is a very intentional decision, but also a little perplexing if you're coming from other pieces of software, is that when you start, there's no time signature. It's just a single quarter rest. That opens the door for so much creativity. And here is Daniel Spreadbury, senior product manager of Dorico, on why they made that design decision. We really wanted to to make it clear that when you start a piece of music in Dorico, it's really like starting from a blank piece of paper. No matter how true that really is in Sibelius and Finale, because of course you can change all those things, sometimes at a cost. You know, if you've already written some music in Finale and then you change the time signature, you can have a lot of ties and all sorts of other stuff to clean up, which you won't have in Dorico. But it's just that that kind of hopefully inviting. I mean, some people might say, oh, it's a bit daunting. There's literally nothing there but one quarter rest. I've got to decide everything. But yes, you do. You're the creative person. You do have to decide everything. This is one of the many design decisions that I think is totally brilliant in Dorico. It has opened the door for my own personal creativity, and it's such a beautiful product. I can't say enough good things about it. I use it every single day. There is a free version, Dorico SE, that gives you practically all the options that the full version of Dorico gives you, up to two stabs. So if you're doing bass duets or any kind of duets like that or exercises, that's more than enough. Dorico.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Every day when I sit down to practice, I get up my phone and I boot up Modacity, which is my practicing companion, and I have a specific routine I go through, and here is Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelf on what he does each day with Modacity. What I do when I load Modacity every day is if I don't have a playlist constructed already, what I do is I go in and I think, how long do I have to practice right now? Okay, I've got 40 minutes. Cool, I'm going to do five minutes on meditation, get my body state right. I'm going to do scales for five minutes and I'm going to visualize and I'm going to do this piece that I'm working on. You just set it up, see the budget and follow the budget effortlessly by delegating that to the phone. Letting my phone do all those logging details has been so great for my practicing. I can't recommend this app highly enough. Love it, love it, love it. Learn more at modacity.co. And we have a special offer if you go to our site for lifetime access to this app. It's so cool. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. Well, you, you, I'm sure you could stay as long as you like. You sound great, my friend. The, those videos that you've been posting during the pandemic, what a, what a, what a sound you get. It just There's this musical creativity oozing out. And with the backdrop that I'm seeing, at least here, you could tell like, oh, wow, Peter's had met, met many and varied musical interests. And I'm not surprised that you got the rock and roll roots uh, for sure. Well, um, that's what part of that project is. It's like, that's what I grew up with. I mm-hmm. grew up with the Stones and the Beatles and the Who and all that, you know, Jefferson Airplane, all those, that was my time. That was when I was growing up. So during this pandemic, it was like, I'm going to go back to my roots. I can't play with anybody, so I'm going to try to make as much music as I can with just me. I'm really not a singer. I haven't sung since Glee Club in junior high. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I thought, well, I'm just going to try to sing and play at the same time, which was a challenge in and of itself because, you know, first playing, and you're, you, you've got two separate lines going on at the same time and supportive and har- harmony and melody. It's like, so it took a while to get really comfortable with singing and playing. And then also you have the issue of 
both of those instruments, bass and voice, are uh, movable pitch. You know, the pitch mm -hmm. is a moving target in both of them. So it took a while to really get pitch centered. And what I found is this has really improved my basic musicianship to be able to, to do that. You know, I have always been, I'm sorry, am I talking too much? No, this is what this is. This is, it's just like hanging out with a, with a, with a beverage. <laughs> okay. so, the, the other, I've always kind of been fascinated with singing and playing because in the rock bands that I was in, you know, the, the guitar, you know, we, we would try to sing. I was never a great singer, but, but the thing about that is you've got frets. Mm -hmm. So then early in my classical training, when I started learning for Cuesta Bellamano, you know, you know, Mozart. Of course, yeah. yeah. And, and it was like, yeah, I, I, I could play, I got it, I got it down, I could play it. And then I thought, well, I'm going to try to sing and play. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to do this singing and playing for a while. So for a while, I it was, you know, look, I'm not a good singer, but I was kind of able to pull off singing the baritone part and um, playing the bass part. <laughs> Wow, that is a trip. I have I have seen a couple of people do that, and it's always mind boggling. There's this great Miloslav Gaidos, this great Czech bass player. I have I have vi some grainy s s cell phone footage from 15 years ago of him doing that back in Chicago. It's oh, oh, it's oh, incredible. Playing and singing. Yeah, playing and singing. Yeah, yeah. I'll dig it, it out of. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do, it, but it really stretches you, mm -hmm. it, and it really improves your ear. Because really, what's music about? It's all about your ear. And what a good pandemic project too to like go back to like th like kind of revisit your musicianship like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So you were talking. You know, you had mentioned about all these instruments, and, yeah. and m many of these, most of these, I can kind of play. Like I got pretty good at sitar for a while. Wow. This is my sitar in the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here's my real instrument. There we go. But that's my Panormo. Uh huh. Beautiful. That's like a student. That was like my student base. So generally, the the Panormo, and most times the Panormo is in here. It's at Disney Hall or at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm -hmm. So I use this other bass to practice, and it, it's not a very good bass. But in a way, I think practicing on a not very good bass is a good thing. I can, I totally agree. What? Why do you think that? I love your thoughts because I so I have I have that thought in my head too, but I don't think I've articulated it very well. I think that there's something to that. Well, if you can get a crap bass to sound good, then when you get a real instrument, it's like wow, mm -hmm. it's you know what I mean. It, it, yeah, that, that's always been my my approach is that I I want to try to make that little bass sound as good as it can and yeah you know you're practicing you can realize what its limitations are but the, it's the limitations of the instrument not of your technique or your ability if you get to the point where you can get that bass to sound as good as it can mm -hmm. then you've learned a lot and you can then transfer all that to a real fine instrument yeah and especially with a, an instrument on the level of what you have you know i i have an instrument not nearly as good but even that i sometimes like to put on the practice mute and that sort of thing i almost get seduced by my own sound not that my sound's that great but you know i i find that i i uh i, I i'm more critical with myself sometimes if i don't have that that you know it's like listening on a great stereo system versus maybe my iphone speaker or something like that yeah you know and I, I totally agree with you. And, and you know, so I, I know a lot of players who would like, yeah, you know, my instrument's holding me back, you know, that kind of a thing. Or if I only had a good instrument, then I'd sound great. And that, you know what? That's a cop out. I remember early in my career, one of the first auditions, soon after I got into the San Diego Symphony, it was an audition in the San Francisco Symphony. I'm going to get back to my early days in San Diego in a minute, but I, I went up there with uh, my roommate, Mark Dresser, and um, we both took that out. We both we both took the audition in San Diego and we both got into San Diego at the same time and then we became roommates. So I was Mark Dresser's roommate for years. Wow. And, and we practiced together and we'd go, we'd do shit and we'd go to work together and, and the, you know Mark, right? Oh yeah, I know Mark really well, yeah. So um, I'll tell you stories about Mark in a minute. <laughs> so anyway, we went up there and I remember there was this guy there who had like a plywood base and he sounded great and he won the audition. Mm. So it's like, no, it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? I it's know. like. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah, anyway, I, I, Mark and I, we're, we're still good friends. And, and I remember in the early days after Mark left the San Diego Symphony, I can't remember where he moved to. He may have moved to New York, but he would call me on the phone and he'd play stuff over the phone mm -hmm. to me and say, here, check this out. I'm doing this stuff where you divide the string into three parts and you do... do, do, do. <laughs> They said, I got this little amp, these pickups over on the top of my strings here so I can get the after found. And, you know, it's, it's like, it, it, the park's great. <laughs> it, it's a great. The musical journey that he is on is just so fascinating to me. I've, I've, I went, this is maybe four years ago at this point, but I went and spent some time with Mark down at UC San Diego and, and was checking out. He has this amazing Carlin Hutchins bass, this huge thing. I don't know if you've, you've seen that thing before, but I got to play a few notes on that. And then, yeah. That that at, the re, the pickups with the after links and the string right. and the the right. work he's done on just the harmonics on the bass it's it's fascinating right right yeah it it is and the thing is he incorporates it in his improvisations mm -hmm. and and um, that's what he would do with me he would call me up and say check this out and just do some improvising and it was it was great um, and and I remember that time we both went up to San Francisco to audition. We drove in his VW van with our basses in the back. And the whole way up, we were uh, practicing polyrhythms. <laughs> three against five, five against seven, three against, you know, the, all these things. We would just practice doing polyrhythms with each other. Oh, that is awesome. Well, you certainly had enough time on that drive to do it. You probably practice every conceivable polyrhythm on that. <laughs> Wow, small world. <laughs> yeah, so so in, in, anyway, that's kind of my background with San Diego and bass and orchestras yeah. and this episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contrabass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. I am so proud to have my course with Discover Double Bass Beginner's Classical Bass out in the world. This was a long time coming, friends, and this course is designed, as the name implies, for beginner bassists who want to learn how to play classical music or for more experienced players who wish to revisit the foundations of technique. The course is comprised of 66 lessons over four hours and covers a wide range of topics on classical bass, which will make a real difference to you playing. It is the perfect course for beginners. I feel weird saying that since it's my course, but I, I definitely believe in it, to build a solid foundation of double bass technique and to help you feel confident playing. Many of the Lessons include transcriptions of the pieces, exercises, and etudes, so you have everything you need to practice at home. I spent hundreds of hours putting this together over the last few years. I'm so glad to see it out in the world. We have a link to it in the show notes, or just visit discoverdoublebase.com slash Jason Heath. 86 you got there then to LA, LA Phil. Right, the audio, exactly, 86. Okay. Uh, so, and, and what we were talking again on the phone uh, the other day about like me just noticing the changes here in, in San Francisco, uh, they got a new hall in 1980 and that of course changed everything up. They split off the opera and the ballet and then different at Blomstead's long tenure here and the improvements of the orchestra. And it's just, um, it's, it's interesting to look at the, the, you know, kind of do a longitudinal study maybe of these ensembles and just see like, like what were some of the, it was already obviously a good orchestra orchestra when you were in there in 86, but um, it's evolved a lot. Like what were some of the landmarks that have happened either they're like in terms of uh, performance facilities or that kind of thing or oh, even yeah. music directors? Disney Hall was the, the big transformation, mm -hmm. but really, it's, you know, Ernest Fleischman, do you know that name? Yes, but remind me or, or educate the listeners. He's the guy who really made the LA Phil what it was and in a way still is. He was the CEO, the you know executive director, and he 
built that orchestra. And I, I guess all the different milestones really are about the music directors. And so, you know, I, I was Previn, but before that it was Zubin. Zubin was a huge input in that orchestra and made, gave it a stature that it didn't have. Now that, that predates me, though I've certainly worked with Zubin a lot because he's frequent guest conductor. And then Jolini was the, the next step after that, and that refined the orchestra even more. Then there was that period with um, Previn that was short lived. It was only about six years of tenure there. And then Esa Pekka was the next guy who really changed the face of the orchestra, did a lot of hiring, and um, changed the orchestra to be one of more of modern forward thinking. In terms of repertoire or in terms yes. of... In terms of repertoire. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot more adventurous stuff. Though the orchestra had always been known for groundbreaking and trying to do new and different stuff. So there, there, there's those um, landmarks of the orchestra that is who the music directors were over time and the changes that they made. Then there's the landmark of who the different executive directors are, because Ernest was a powerhouse, and he was followed by Deborah Borda, who was another powerhouse who totally put the orchestra on a different financial footing and a different public branding. So that's another landmark that happens in orchestras, at least in, in this orchestra. You got the music directors, then you got the executive directors. Then there's the contracts. I, you, you probably don't know this about me, but I, um, I was chair of the orchestra and lead chair of the negotiating committee for the LA Phil for probably 30 of my 35 years there. So I negotiated probably 30 years worth of contracts for the orchestra and each contract for me was about getting the orchestra to be to recognize the artistic worth in terms of compensation mm -hmm. so every contract that we did had huge leaps in pay and benefits so that when I started my first negotiation there which was 1990 we ranked about 10th in pay by the end of my negotiating uh, for this band, um, we were ranked number one in pay. And that changes things because that means when you have an opening, you're going to get people from major orchestras who want to come and play there because it pays well and you got the weather and you got artistic growth and people recognize that. So we've been able to attract players from all levels of orchestras internationally and nationally. Yeah. And that has this momentum. If you get that, then you get the more, the, the better the players, the higher the artistic level goes, level goes up and it's just a, it's an upward cycle. Right. And so, the, and, and so that affects like, you know, who wants to be on the board and the board is really important for, for us orchestras because these are the people who help finance the whole operation. What got you interested in the, the, so I had, I had no idea about that, that about you. That's one of the fun, fun things about doing these interviews for me personally. Um, w was that an interest of yours? Like nego cause I, I think being, uh, run leading negotiations for a major symphony orchestra would strike fear into the hearts of <laughs> probably many people listening. Like, was that, did you have some background in that or like what, what, uh, sent you down that path? Uh, well, my mom always said, <laughs> why do you want to be a bass player? You should be a lawyer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's my background. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> um, I did a little bit of negotiating in San Diego, but I've always kind of been a politically active person, mm -hmm. whether it's local, national, or international. I'm, that stuff always interests me, and um, trying to help my colleagues get better pay, better work, a better life was always something that was important to me and still is important to me. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't really have training, though I did really well at it. 
<laughs> and it's so much so much so that you know eventually at, at some point i kind of got fairly because i had been doing it so long then um the federation the national federation the, the, there was a push to get me involved with the um national negotiate media negotiations mm -hmm. so i started doing that probably more than 10 years ago um through ixam media committee and i'm actually currently i'm chair of the ixam media committee which means we end up negotiating the media contracts nationally for orchestras and so i've had a lot of interactions with the ceos with the managers of a lot of, of almost all of all the major orchestras and of um the middle mid-size and minor orchestras they all end up at the negotiating table and i'm on the other side of the table from them so i got to know a lot about the business and how it works and how it runs and not only from a media point but also from you know just a local uh orchestra's point of view Wow. Well, what what a what a job and 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 what a changing landscape even prior to this pandemic. I'm sure it's 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 been uh, uh, it's probably been quite a year for you if you've been if you continue to be involved. Well, I in that. stopped doing negotiations. My last I negotiated the last um, what we call the master agreement, the last CBA. But then the pandemic happened a year ago, and so uh, after I negotiated my last. CBA, I stepped off. It was because it was time to let the younger people know, uh, start doing it. And um, so I did help advise the current orchestra committee, who is chaired by David Allen Moore, who's a good friend of mine. And so we speak often and I would give him advice about, you know, do this, do that. That's bullshit. That isn't. Go for it. Go for this. You know, just, you know that 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 kind of stuff. Um, the pandemic uh, really screwed things up for a lot of orchestras, but we're doing we're doing well. It's interesting to talk to folks who are in di or, or different orchestras of different sizes, you know, anyone from like you know, part time ropa gigs like I used to play back in Chicago to obviously groups like L.A. Phil or Chicago Symphony or something. It's, it's 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 interesting from an outsider perspective just to see how people are navigating this landscape or in general. Forget about the pandemic. Just what a what a what an awesome responsibility you have negotiating contracts like that. I mean, just the 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 way you're affecting your colleagues. Uh, financial well-being or just overall well-being it's it's an incredible responsibility y yes and i <laughs> the more, and if i thought about it too much it would kill <laughs> me yeah <laughs> but i try not to think about that too much and just go into it with i'm going to do the best i can and get the the most i can for my people mm -hmm. uh for my colleagues and um whether, whether it's the la phil or whether it's nationally for all uh, musicians who do media work, yeah. um, all symphonic musicians who do media work. So the basic formula, at least coming out of the 80s, out of the 70s and 80s, and probably through the 90s, the basic formula for a successful orchestra is that 50% of the budget is to be earned through ticket sales, and 50% of the budget is um, contributed income or earned income. So that 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 was your basic model that made for a, uh, an orchestra to be healthy and successful. That's why boards are very important because they help raise that fifty percent. So I talked a little bit earlier about Ernest Fleischmann, but what Ernest Fleischmann helped do for this orchestra was set up our programs at the Hollywood Bowl. The Hollywood Bowl became and is an internationally known music venue seats 18,000 and w the LA Phil runs and operates the Hollywood Bowl in our orchestra so I gave you that 50-50 split of uh, earned income earned contributed income versus ticket sales the LA Phil for many years I don't know what it's it, certainly this year it's totally different but generally we earn 70% of our budget which meant that we only needed 30% of ticket revenue. So that allowed us that that allowed us to pay musicians a lot more because we earn a lot more. It also meant that the orchestra could do a lot more experimenting without having to worry as much about 
the ticket revenue. But we've been and, and since Borda, who really set Deborah Borda set the finances of the orchestra into really great shape, even our experimental stuff, we branded ourselves as an orchestra that's cutting edge. <laughs> and so even those programs where we do crazy outside stuff sold well. And moving into Disney Hall for several years, we were 100% sold. So mm -hmm. it's like it, we, were, we were just, there was a period there where we were just golden. Mm -hmm. So the thing about the pandemic is an orchestra like ours was hurt even more because we couldn't earn. The Hollywood Bowl has been shut down. Mm -hmm. The uh, Disney Hall is shut down. We couldn't earn 70% of our budget. An orchestra that only earning 40% of its budget was hurt a lot less yeah. than an orchestra like ours, that's which is earning 70% of its budget. The other, the only other orchestra that comes close to ours in terms of earned income is the BSO, Boston, which I believe is about 60%, maybe 60, I can't remember, you know, because I haven't been doing this for a couple of years now, but it's something like something like in the 60% range of earned income. So that's another very financially successful orchestra because of earned income. And again, that's because of their Tanglewood and their mm -hmm. uh, POPs programs, mm -hmm. which is, I guess in a way equivalent or, you know, that's our Hollywood Bowl for them. Our Hollywood Bowl raises so much money. Their Tanglewood and their Pops raises so much money. As opposed to something like in the CSO, the Chicago, who their summers are at Ravinia, but they don't own or operate Ravinia. They're hired hands at Ravinia. Yeah. So there's no earned income there. You follow me? I completely follow you. And I know that as you, if you look over time at Ravinia, that percentage, I'm not sure if uh, how accurate my math is, but definitely the number of CSO weeks has reduced over over the years as other stuff is. And, and uh, yeah, so so, yeah, that's a giant disadvantage of not owning your own owning your own thing, especially your summer venue. Or, and, and even if you don't own it, at least not being the presenters. Yeah. So, for instance. Um, the Hollywood Bowl, we present rock shows. Well, mm -hmm. we get all the revenue from that. Not only that, we get the parking revenue. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so it, we were definitely hurt much more by the pandemic because of our financial structure. But we're, 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 the board stepped up. The board really came through for the players. We were able to negotiate with uh, the current orchestra committee was able to negotiate. We're at something like 65% um, uh, uh, of income, 67%, mm -hmm. something like, I can't remember the exact number. So it's like, we're, we're still being paid. We're being paid to stay home. We do work on occasion. We do some stuff, um, some video programs, which you've probably seen at the mm -hmm. on the internet. But we're, mm -hmm. we're gonna be fine. And when we go back to, when we finally get back to work, when everyone gets vaccinated and the world returns to normal, I'm sure that our um, financial model will become as robust as it once was. Well, all I know is I'm gonna be the most avid concert goer you have ever met <laughs> when this blows over. Because now we're at that point where if you think back to a year ago, you can pretty, you know, I remember exactly what I was doing a year ago because I, we, everything was about to go all over the cliff, right? Like I was I was in Pittsburgh coming home from the Pittsburgh Double Bass Symposium and then we had this uh, guest artist out here for the San Francisco Bass Bash and that was the last time this bass has left <laughs> <laughs> left this place, you know. Um, so, but boy, here in the Bay Area, it's it's and I'm, it's likely similar in LA. That you know, outdoor dining's back, and so there are some musicians playing out. And obviously, not the San Francisco Symphony, but the you know, small groups and stuff. And you can just see the hunger for music and people. And people are so happy. So, if that's any indicator of um, you know, and maybe that's just, that's just my experience, but I definitely I, I know that I will be at a lot more concerts than I used to be. Yeah. Well, luck, everyone returns and, and um, some of these orchestras that have been really hurt, like the Met Opera Orchestra, which is such a tragedy. Um, hopefully everyone can be made whole, at, at least at least brought up to where they were before this. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it, this is something, again, not having a full-time orchestra job. The, you know, I've always looked up to people in your position as that's like the, the pinnacle of the career, you know, b- at least by my definition. And so the people that end up in these jobs, uh, oftentimes you're so focused on, get, on getting to this point that you're not doing 25 other things like I do. You know, I'm a little more pandemic-proof just because I, I work in the business. I do this and that. I, I just have been a jack-of-all-trades. You get to somebody at the level of, you know, being a principal player in the Met or certainly being in the L.A. Phil, you know, when you're so uh, your career is so focused on that performing, uh, that which is great. And what a cool opportunity to be in an orchestra with that high percentage of ticket revenue. Right. Most orchestras would kill for that. And then this pandemic happens and it's like you flipped on its head. Yeah. And, and so but like I said, we were lucky. Um, our board stepped up and did the best they could to take care of us so that we weren't what that board did to the Met Orchestra, yeah. which I think is uh, tragic. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm sure I, I'm not, I, I'm, and I know there are many other orchestras out there where also the board has let their players down. Mm-hmm. But there are those shiny spots where the boards have taken care of their people yeah. as they should. Yeah, well, that's that's great to hear that that's been happening in L.A. That's uh, I, I can't wait to to get down. And I have, I, I'm i such a fool. I have yet to see an L.A. Phil concert. I've actually been to Disney Hall back when I taught high school orchestra. I brought my kids and we they, there was no concert that day. So we did a tour. But um, no, whenever that is, 20 late 2021, 2022, whenever, whenever I'm back at concerts, I'm well, looking forward to it. A lot of friends there. So we can we can get you in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, it's so cool. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any other video projects in the works? Is this something that you've just been like? You get an idea, you work on it for a while, you put it out, or are you trying to like get every day work on some new tune? Or well, what have I, you been doing? I keep, yes, I keep practicing, and and I am working on new tunes. Um, I have about five of them in the can, ready to go. But I, what I've noticed by looking at stuff online, I know that there's bass players out there that put stuff out constantly. And I think people get turned off when you are constantly putting your material out there in that way. And I, my, my plan is to release maybe one a month or so to put one out there so that people don't get bored with what I do. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about people getting bored with it because I think it's interesting, but I think it's also kind of nice to keep them waiting a little bit. Um, and, and we were talking about this. Are you you're you're going for just one take on these, right? For the most part, yes. These yeah. are all. I mean, I mean, it's not one take. I do several takes. Right, right, right. Yeah, I do several takes, and then I I'll listen back to them, and then go, yeah, that out of, out of them, yeah, there's flaws here and there, and I wish I had done that differently. And mm-hmm. but yeah, I'll take. I'll pick the best take. Um, and sometimes it's the first take and sometimes it's the last take. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like about how it goes with my recording projects too. I either right. go downhill or uphill. <laughs> right. And then to have that added restriction, I guess, of it's, I'm going to g- g- pick a, a complete take out of this because it's so easy in today's world to take 10 seconds from here and 20 seconds from here. And if I, if I do that, and I do that for some of my projects, but there's something, especially as someone who has spent so many years getting up on stage and performing live, it's nice to just have something where you just let it rip. And, and even if you do a few takes, you know, here is a complete unedited performance. Yeah. I'm not a fan of slicing and dicing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's like real, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's just perform it, just do it. And uh, flaws, warts, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. it's there. And if you listen, you'll hear my, my flaws and my warts. But, you know, that's, <laughs> that's part of real life, you know. Yeah. Well, I hope you keep it up and I hope you keep it up past the pandemic. And hey, maybe it, you do a few more years. And if you end up retiring from L.A. Phil, maybe you, you keep doing it. And pretty soon we're going to there. It's it's going to be one of the hottest YouTube channels for bass because it's really it's one of those things I was watching late at night. And I'm like, dang, yeah, Peter sounds great. And these arrangements are super interesting. And then I'm thinking I have I am over 50 percent of the people in the L.A. Phil bass section I've had on the podcast. I think almost everybody at this point. So uh, <laughs> for that and uh, many other reasons I thought it'd be fun to sit down and hang out for a while. I want to make sure that the base part that I create for it is 
in a in a way virtuosic mm-hmm. and it, it can't just be like oh i'm just going to lay down the bass line and try to sing the bass it has to be there has to be more to it for me mm-hmm. and and so part of the idea was like deconstructing these songs and some of these songs are very like i talked about you know i am the walrus that's a very complex song with lots of other instruments and lots of parts going on it you kind of want to deconstruct it for just bass and voice mm-hmm. and to do that requires a, you know a lot of different <laughs> techniques that's that's a tall order it's a tall order for something especially like with with the that you know a lot of complexity to it and different timbres right. and textures and harmonies and <laughs> yeah but it, it's been fun it's been fun for me and and the whole idea was to try to you know, when I was doing rock and roll, I talked about that in my young days. It was like I got to be a pretty good bass player, and you know, and and I would always do try to come up with really difficult lines because we'd write our own tunes, and you know, we didn't do covers. We would write our own songs, and um, the guitar players are like, "No, that's too busy. Just keep it simple. You know, no, just you know, just roots and fifths. You know," <laughs> and it's like. At, at that, even back then, it was like I want to do stuff without a guitar. I don't want a guitar anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just just bass, drums, and voice. How's that? <laughs> Get rid of you guitar players. <laughs> hey, well, you get to finally scratch that itch, right? You know, right. Like, yeah, men- so that was. This is kind of a continuation of that. It's yeah. like, okay, how much can I do with just bass and cover as much of the tune as I can? Well, I love it. Keep it up. Peter, thanks for chatting. Folks, definitely check out his YouTube channel. Just search for it on YouTube, or we've got a link to that in the show notes as well. And you can also check out his LA Phil bio page. That's linked up also. Thank you for listening. However you discovered this podcast, maybe you've been with me on this whole crazy journey since, what is it, 2007? Oh, goodness. Or maybe you're, you're recent. Uh, if, if Either way, if you want to check out more from Peter's colleagues in the L.A. Phil, you can search. Uh, L.A. Phil actually would come up <laughs> with, I think I've talked to almost, not everybody, but almost everybody in that base section. And a great way to search is with our app, which is free and is available on any platform, I think, that... that uh, uh, apps are on uh, just look for contrabass conversations and it's a great way especially if you're looking for a topic because anything that we have that we've written the show notes over the ever since 2007 it, it comes up super quick in the app you can search on our website contrabassconversations.com that will work too it does work but the app is a pretty cool experience and you can download things for listening later um, obviously you can do that on whatever you're listening to this on but the app has some extra stuff that we've gotten in there that we've got in there and it's just kind of a cool way to experience this podcast it's fun to do this you know it's it's not all i do it may appear to be all i do if uh if you're just watching from the outside i would consider it to be uh, less than 25 percent of what i do at this point in my life probably at least 25 nah probably 25 percent maybe 30 percent it depends and and it has blended quite well for me into travel which has not happened in a while but is happening i have some stuff on the books i will announce soon i think they're on the books i'm not announcing anything until i'm not announcing anything until i'm actually there just because i i i don't want to get my hopes up and dash uh, another multiple times but but we'll see i know you know rationally speaking travel will be coming back and i've got all this new gear that i'll be taking on the road to capture more video perhaps capture the podcast in video form i I just never know you know i have all everybody i've talked to the last year i have video we've been doing it on zoom but the thing is when i put out the video on youtube or i just put out like the still image that's auto generated by my podcast host they get like the exact same views which makes me think nobody really wants to watch this on youtube they do get some views and 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 it's good for search and that sort of thing um i would personally never sit there staring at this image on youtube uh, although i guess you could walk around doing other things but it's something every once in a while people just say hey jason why do you do why don't you put up the video of these conversations and to be honest it's well there's that it's like well maybe you want it, but maybe you don't. And the data says you don't. Um, the other thing is if I do video, I want the, it's just like another thing. And, and there are so many projects in life or so many things to do with your time. Like the way that these are edited is not conducive to also putting the video together. I guess it's a short way. And then there are all these other factors with video. Oh, you got a terrible connection. They're backlit. It looks like garbage. Okay. Maybe that's fine. But I don't know if I do video, I want the video to be good. 
and I don't want to have to think about the video uh, sometimes, if that makes sense. Um, so w that's maybe a very long, and maybe I'm just getting burned out at this point during the day, but, but I do think I'm going to do some video interviews. They might not be these long-form things. They might be things that I capture on the road and then incorporate into other episodes, documentary style, or who knows? I've got the cameras, I've got the gear to get some good footage these days when I'm out and about, and uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm open to it. If you really want to see th these conversations, like what I did with Peter or what I have coming up, let me know in terms of video. It's just a thing that it's just, I, I just feel like we're at capacity here at Contrabase Conversations, <laughs> Team Contrabase Conversations, uh, me, Trevor, and the other folks that work on this. We're, we don't really, there's really not bandwidth to do that. And um, yeah. I guess that's all I have to say on that. I guess I'll close out. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Controversy Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful, award-winning bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I am your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm.